Okay, now we're moving to our next speaker, um, Dr. Till Phelps Bondarov. Um, he's an expert in illegal fishing and his work on this subject has played an important role in efforts to reconceptualize illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing from an administrative crime to a serious form of organized wild, uh, wildlife crime. Dr. Till Phelps Bondarov conducts research on a wide range of topics as director of research for Oceans Asia, which is a Hong Kong based marine conservation organization. He has a PhD in politics and international studies from the University of Cambridge and BAs in political science and international relations from the University of Calgary. His academic research examines the strategic use of international law by non state actors and political strategy. Today, Dr. Till Phelps Bondarov will talk about the impact of fishing, overfishing, and illegal fishing on marine wildlife. Thank you so much for being here with us, and please welcome Dr. Till Phelps Bondarov. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, so hi, everybody. I'm going to share my screen here as well. Here we are. There we go. Yes, so as Lou said, today I'm going to be talking about the impact of fishing, overfishing, and illegal fishing on marine wildlife. That is an incredibly ambitious topic. So my plan for today is to do sort of a, a survey of some issues in fishing and then focus specifically on illegal fishing um, and some of the legal implications around that, as that's my area of expertise and specialty. But I will be sort of doing an overall survey of uh, fisheries issues. I'm the re Director of Research of Oceans Asia. We're a marine conservation organization uh, based out of Hong Kong. I'm operating remotely here in Victoria, Canada. And if you're interested in learning more about our work or supporting our work, please visit our website at oceansasia.org. You can follow along on our social media channels. I have the privilege of working with a colleague who's a professional uh, wildlife photographer who's speaking a little bit later on today. Um, and so we have some great pictures of some of our work and some issues around marine conservation. And um, what we do as an organization, um, we do a lot of things. The world of marine conservation is, is a busy one and our whiteboard of future projects is also quite busy. Um, but we work on issues around marine plastic pollution, um, illegal fishing in Hong Kong waters. We investigate uh, illegal fishing and organized crime in the industry. We have porpoise conservation project. We have been working on, uh, we have a report coming out shortly on uh, false medical claims around medical, uh, around marine wildlife products. And we've been working on looking at crime in the fishing industry on a wide range of issues, um, ranging from shark fins, sea cucumbers, seahorses, transshipment, and, and tackling aspects relating to legality in the fisheries industry. And I'm happy to answer questions a bit more about Oceans Asia afterwards, but let's get right into um, our content. So today I'm going to take you through a, a broad survey of the scale and state of global fisheries. I'm going to look at the impact of fishing and overfishing, and then we're going to talk a bit more about illegal fishing, my area of expertise. And we're going to take a deeper dive into what is IUU fishing, the scale of IUU fishing, harms, and I'll be making the case that IUU fishing illegal fishing that is, is a form of transnational organized crime and exploring some of the legal implications of that, as well as looking at areas and instances of crime at various stages in the fishery supply chain. So we've got a lot to cover today. Um, do please type in questions. I'm very much looking forward to your questions. And let's get right into it. So when it look, we look at fisheries, we have a large, it is a global, a global situation. And we have a massive global fleet of fishing vessels. There are over 4.56 million fishing vessels around the world. And of those, about 67,000 of them are over 24 meters. So those are our larger industrial size fishing vessels. Now this is a reduction. The numbers have gone down by 2.8% since 2016. And leading the way has been China, which has made a significant effort in reducing its capacity. Uh, it, China reduced its capacity by 20% in recent years from 1,071,000 fishing vessels to 864,000 fishing vessels. And as we'll see, um, overcapacity is a driver, a major driver of overfishing. When it comes to global fishing production, we are talking about around 179 million metric tons um, in 2018 numbers with a first sale value of about 
250 billion dollars USD. Uh, just for folks listening at home, all the prices will be in USD and everything will be a metric uh, ton because I'm here in Canada and we use good, reasonable, reliable numbers. Um, this works out to reasonably about 20.5 kilograms of fish per capita as far as, as weight. And when you're looking at the breakdown of these, these numbers, oops, excuse me, um, we're seeing about 46% of fisheries production is aquaculture. That number's uh, got a little squiggly line there because there are questions around aquaculture for human consumption and for animal consumption, oil and fish meal, which we can explore if people are more interested. Um, what's interesting is that consumption has been going up and it's been going up considerably in recent years. So that in 1961, in developing developed countries, that is, um, the average annual per capita consumption of fish was 17.4 kilograms. Whereas in 2017, it was 24.4 kilograms. And in the developing world, that number went from 5.2 kilograms per capita in 1961 to 19.4 kilograms in 2017. So we have increased capacity, increased fishing, and increased consumption, all, uh, all issues uh, that are leading to issues in our oceans. And by the way, these numbers are all from the FAO, unless I, I say otherwise. And we're looking at the scale of the industry itself. A lot of individuals are involved in industry. So we have uh, almost 60 million people employed in fisheries around the world. And of those, about 39 million people are working in the primary capture fisheries and about 20 million in aquaculture. Of note is only 14% of those folks are women. And uh, we can do a gendered analysis of the fishing industry if folks are more interested as well. And this capacity and this fishing effort is leading to significant impacts on our oceans. So the FAO a few years ago, 2015, estimated that 91% of fish stocks have been described as being at full capacity or overexploited. In the last few years, the FAO has changed their language around how they describe these um, state of oceans and fisheries. So they now use a different terminology, but fish stocks that are at unsustainable, bio, un, biologically unsustainable levels. In 1974, 10% of fish stocks, and in 2017, 34% of fish stocks. Um, and I always like to show this picture here to my students when I'm talking about this issue, because we have a bit of an, a concern, a problem with identifying what is a healthy ocean, what is an unhealthy ocean. You know, the two pictures on the side of the screen here, one of those could be an ocean with a sustainable and happy fish population. And the other one could be, you know, suffering decline or collapsed fisheries. We can't tell. And so when you're doing advocacy and communications around fisheries, you often have to get around that blockage of folks just can't see the harm. We know what a clear cut looks like, healthy forest, an unhealthy forest, but it's hard to tell with an ocean. Just returning to fish population declines, um, the FAO says that fish stocks that are fished within biologically sustainable levels in 1974, it was 90%. Now it's supposedly, uh, or 2017, it was 66%. Again, these numbers are a bit fuzzy because of what constitutes biologically sustainable levels. And that's entering sort of the politics of, of math and science and how this relates to fisheries management. So there's also complicated aspects there. But the overall takeaway is that our oceans are not in a very good state. Fish populations are in decline and leading the way on that is overcapacity and overfishing. And just to return to the scale of global fishing, we are talking about millions of metric tons of fish. So in 2018, the capture fisheries um, captured 84.4 million metric tons, and that's up from 2017. Um, these populations, the major global fisheries are tuna, cephalopods, shrimp, and lobster. And we have major drivers of this, right? So as I've mentioned, overcapacity. There are a lot of fishing vessels of all sizes, but principally large uh, industrial fishing vessels that can take huge amounts of fish, more than an entire fleet of small boats. We have increased technology. So for example, you have fish aggregating devices, FADs, satellites and sonar, monofilament nets that are incredibly strong and durable, bottom trawlers, and satellite technology linking um, fish, uh, fish fleets and communications between them, and a whole host of other aspects, all making it very easy to catch fish, uh, which means we can catch more fish and have a greater impact on ecosystems, more negative impact that is. Um, there's also illegal fishing, which I'll be turning to momentarily, but there's another factor which is important worth mentioning, and that's subsidies. So one of the things that's fueling an overcapacity in our fishing fleet is the fact that governments are subsidizing fishing fleets and fishing operations, and they're doing so to a massive amount, to the tune of $35.4 billion. This is a new research um, study from Sumela et al. Um, from last year, or two years ago, I suppose now. That is a huge amount of money, um, and a lot of that money 
$22.2 billion of it is going to capacity enhancement. So we literally have governments who are investing heavily in the capacity of their fishing fleets as we see declines in populations. And that's um, hugely problematic. Um, just to look at those numbers a little bit more in a little bit more detail, the major countries that are subsidizing their fleets um, are China, the European Union, the United States, the Republic of Korea, and Japan. And those five countries represent 58% of subsidies globally, or $20.5 billion. And that is a ton of money. And it's money that, again, is, is fueling our ability to catch fish better and, and more fish. And that has a huge impact on ecosystems. And those, those subsidies cover things like fuel, they'll, co they'll be grants, foregone payments, um, foregone taxes, loan guarantees, services, um, and, and things of that nature. So there's a wide range of subsidies, direct and indirect, that all can be tackled from a policy perspective. So folks who are looking at tackling issues around fisheries from a legal perspective could dive into subsidies and look at reducing them in certain areas to reduce capacity and reduce fishing effort. Um, just to um, jump onto one other issue that's worth mentioning with respect to fisheries, that's bycatch. So bycatch are the incidental catch of species that are not the target species. And most of these, these animals that are caught, some of them are released, some of them are not, but typically um, many of the fish that are released do die because they've been removed from their habitat, crushed in large nets, and, and for other variety of reasons. But the FAO estimated in 2017 that 10% of global catches were bycatch. Now, this number is very fuzzy. There's lots of different statistics that are out there. It's very hard to estimate. And so some estimates put the number as high as 40%. Um, a recent study, again, by Simela et al. Um, suggested that 17 to 22% of the catch in the United States is bycatch. So again, we are seeing a significant number of fish that are being caught and discarded and caught and, and, and wasted or aren't the target species. And some of this bycatch, of course, are things like the vaquita here, um, sea turtles and target marine mammals and other species. And that has a devastating impact on species that are not currently hunted, um, but might just be killed incidentally. So just to speak very briefly about the impacts of overfishing, because we do have the situation where there is, um, when you start killing off fish in large numbers, you have impacts on ecosystems. One of those is trophic cascade, where you're taking out species that are a keystone species or an apex predator, and that has a, a knock-on effect throughout the entire ecosystem. So you remove sharks, then other fish species overpopulate and then have you know predate further down the food web. Um, my favorite example are uh, krill, one of my favorite species. In Antarctica, they are a keystone species. Everything is somehow connected to krill and most of the major predators eat krill. If you were to remove krill or significantly reduce their populations, all of these animals would die off um, through starvation. That's whales, porpoises, um, you've got penguins, seals, fish, birds, all host of animals feed on krill. So they're a keystone species. Um, other aspects of removing fish from marine ecosystems, and this is not the time to go into them in too much detail, but you can disrupt nutri nutrient cycling as well. And that, that's critical. And this is something that I've been studying with my work on uh, sea cucumbers. And so I'll show one of my favorite clips here. This is um, sea cucumber doing what it does best. That's nutrient cycling. And there was a study that just came out that explores, I'll let that roll a few times here for folks. Um, there was a study that came out recently that said on one coral reef, uh, sea cucumbers can produce 64,000 metric tons of feces. And what this is doing is it's nutrient cycling, it's cleaning soil, it's doing bioturbation, it's creating habitat for other species. And so if you were removing sea cucumbers from the ecosystem, all of those ecosystem services are lost and that devastates the, the ecosystem and harms other animals. And, and ultimately can lead to extinction of other species. And of course, as we know, extinction is forever. So turning to illegal fishing, illegal fishing is you know, part of our global fishing effort, but it's a significant part. And it's one that um, Oceans Asia is dedicated to combating. When we look at illegal fishing, the term that's often used is IUU fishing, illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. And I'll just jump into those terms very briefly. So illegal fishing are, are forms of fishing that violate the law or regulations. That would be things like fishing out of season, using illegal gear, fishing in the marine protected area with no license, et cetera. Unreported fishing is might be misreported. It might be fishing that's just, you might have faked law books, uh, log books rather. It may not be reported to the authorities at all. And then unregulated fishing is individuals who fish beyond the jurisdiction um, of states or RFMOs or regional fisheries management organizations, that is. Um, and fishers who are maybe actively trying to avoid regulations. You might be using a flag of convenience, a port of convenience, or operating in the high seas. Now, one of the terms that I prefer to use to describe these kinds of activities and, and other ones adjacent to them is fish crime. 
because IUU fishing and illegal fishing really only talks about the act of fishing itself, but it doesn't talk about all the associated crimes that surround that action. And I'll, I'll be exploring those in more detail. But once a fish is caught, there is crime that follows it through the supply chain. And before a fishing boat even leaves port, there's criminal operations. And so I prefer the term fish crime to capture all those different aspects. And, and I'll explore that in a little bit uh, towards the end of my presentation. But when we're talking about illegal fishing, we are talking about large scale operations. A recent study by Sumela et al, again, uh, that's from 2020, hot off the press, it's in my middle of my reading pile here, um, estimated that nine to $17 billion a year is lost um, from illegal fishing. That's revenue. That's how much the, the industry is worth rather. And that amounts to about eight to 14 million metric tons of, um, of fish. The economic losses, again, it's always hard to estimate these things because we are dealing with an illicit market. So the, uh, the numbers involved are, you know, are estimates, of course. But uh, it's estimated that the economic losses to, um, to the illicit trade is between 26 to $50 billion. And that's lost tax revenue from governments to 2 to $4 billion. And we are talking about between 10 to 22% of global fisheries production, or roughly one in five fish that is caught is caught illegally. So this is a large scale problem and it, it, it really overlaps well with the law itself. Now, overall, there's three kinds of IU fishing broadly to create a rough typology. There's people who fish illegally because of ignorance, there's opportunistic folks, and then there's habitual and repeat offenders. These are all forms of illegal fishing, but the greatest focus um, of my interest, and I think are just from a legal perspective, are the habitual offenders, the repeat offenders, folks who have made breaking the law part of their business model. And this is having a huge impact on the ecosystems. And, and I've already talked a bit about these, but illegal fishing itself destroys marine ecosystems. It undermines management efforts, it threatens food security, it harms legitimate fishers, it damages economies and it undermines good governance. And so it, it is, is a problem. And, and on the right here, you see a picture of um, some of the Chinese authorities or the authorities rather in Hong Kong arresting an illegal fishing vessel. So one of the things that's interesting is when we look at illegal fishing, it meets all the criteria under international legal treaties like the UNTOC and, and others in the European Union definitions of organized crime. It's worth highlighting this. So if you look at the definition from the UNTOC, it defines organized crime as a structured group of three or more persons existing for a period of time and acting in concert with the aim of committing one or more serious crimes or offenses established in accordance with the convention in order to obtain directly or indirectly financial or material benefit. Now that's often, we think of organized crime, we think of the Tongs, Yakuza, we think of um, Brando, you know, the Godfather or things from film. But when you have a group of individuals who are fishing illegally, they are engaged in organized crime. And, and it's my argument that presenting illegal fishing and wildlife crime as a form of organized crime is a critical step in reframing the issue to raise our concern for it, to raise government interest in it, and therefore concomitant effects of money and funds and resources and attention from the authorities so we can combat it. And so and I'll be talking a bit more about how we can see crime at every stage of the fishery supply chain. But it's also worth noting how why people engage in illegal fishing. You know, illegal fishing is a high return, low risk operation. There's a lot of places on the high seas where there's weak and low governance. And there's poor monitoring enforcement in many locations. We are talking about a huge percentage of our planet. And again, overcapacity and overfishing. So when you have fish populations collapsing, individuals, governments will implement regulations to try to protect those fish species and populations. And then people may fish illegally in contravention to those regulations because they're either greedy or desperate or a combination of both. Um, or they also just have the capacity to do so. So one thing that I think is often overlooked and we talk about illegal fishing itself, and this is my, my, one of my main goals in life is to convince people that there's, there's this broader ecosystem of adjacent crimes associated with illegal fishing itself. And that is that we see crime and illegal operations at every stage of the fishery supply chain. And we see that it's highly organized and it, it takes many different forms. So let's explore this in a little bit here. Um, and I'll, I'll be very brief and then we can jump into some of the conclusions and I'm looking forward to your questions. So even before a vessel leaves port, we see illegal, illegal actions, legal operations. So for example, in the preparation of fishing vessels for an operation, you'll see forged fishing licenses, bribery and extortion. There'll be flags of convenience or flags of non-compliance if you prefer. There's numerous stories of crew members being enslaved, of people being tricked into fishing contracts. And we also see subsidy abuse and um, companies moving things around and creating shell companies to get licenses and things of that nature. So even before a vessel leaves port, they're engaged in legal activity. 
And then in other instances, we have illegal actions while catching fish. So this might be using illegal gears or methods. So for example, dynamite fishing, FADs or fish aggregating devices, drift nets, long lines in restricted areas, or it might be fishing in restricted areas, using decoys, um, monitoring you know, police operations, spoofing AIS. There's a whole range of illegal activity that individuals use when they're fishing illegally. When it comes to landing fish as well and reporting catch, um, there are lots of examples as well. So we have fishers foraging and falsifying records. We have used, uh, vessels using multiple logs. So the log book they hand to the owner so they can actually record what they caught and the log book they hand to the authorities so that they can demonstrate that they're within compliance for fishing regulations. Um, we have uh, individuals concealing catches. So one practice would be to fill a fishing hold with high value fish and then on the top add a layer of low value fish for which you have a license and as a way of um, the authorities typically don't dig down into a fish hold and so you're able to conceal your catch that way. And there's tons of other aspects going to a port of convenience so a fishing port with low levels of regulation visiting that port um, is, and that's an effective way of you know laundering your fish into the market. Now when it comes to processing catches, you have high grading and false labeling. High grading being basically discarding of lower quality fish so that you can keep the most valuable ones and not take up space in your hold or against your quota. And then false labeling is quite common with fish being labeled the wrong way. Um, there's been some very eye-opening research coming out lately about the false labeling in fisheries markets. If you're paying for an expensive fish, make sure it's the right fish and very often it's not. Um, and so that's another form of, of fraud that takes place. And then when it comes to transporting catches, you see a lot of laundering through transshipment. So that will, that is when a fishing vessel will be unloaded at sea and their, their catch will be taken to port in another vessel, sometimes visiting a port of convenience. And there's also a lot of other examples where you'll have forged export documents and bribery. Um, and there's a lot of human rights violations associated with aspects of transshipment, which I'm, I'm happy to explore if people have questions about that. Oh, sorry. Um, and then when it comes to selling uh, products and consumers, again, there's false labels, uh, false labeling, there's direct sales. Um, and then on, underlying all of this is the money. And I've always said I've had two forensic accountants, we could probably bring down four or five large fishing companies because they are all, many fishing companies are engaged in questionable economic activity, uh, finances and accounting. And you'll see efforts to hide profits through shell companies, underreporting, misreporting, re-invoicing. Um, one practice is setting up a company in a low tax environment and then moving funds and profits around to take advantage of different tax ratios. And there's been some good research done on this. It's very complex. And one of the challenges is we often don't know who is the beneficial owner of a vessel. And there was a study done by the e, um, by a couple of researchers a few years back that found that 70% of flags of convenience we don't know who the owners are. And it's very difficult to actually identify who is the responsible owner for a vessel. That becomes a problem. And one example I don't have on here, because it's not one you expect, is we've actually seen people engaged in fraud in fish judging competitions. So there's a, a famous herring competition in Schrevening in the Netherlands, where um, they, they judge the best herring. And there was a bribery scandal there a few years back. So we see crime at every stage of the supply chain. It's organized, it's insidious, and there's a lot of it. So just exploring some of the, the, the recommendations here, and I'll wrap up and, and go to your questions in, this, in a little bit here. We really do need to strengthen international regulations around shipping um, and vessels. There are not the same kind of regulations for transport vessel, for fishing vessels as there are for transport vessels. And as we've seen, only about 64,000 of the fishing vessels are larger vessels. Uh, there's a lot of small vessels out there that aren't necessarily registered. They don't necessarily have the right numbers and accreditation they're not required to at the moment. Um, but that means that we're not necessarily monitoring what happens. It's important that we also look at a domestic legislation. And that's critical because um, when it comes to things like organized crime, you'll notice in the definition, it said serious crime. Well, under the UNTOC, the definition of a serious crime is a punishment leading to four years or more of incarceration. And that, in some situations, fisheries issues are treated as administrative crimes. Um, and so if you know, someone stole tens of thousands of dollars from the government, they would be on land, they would be charged and put in jail. But if they steal that amount of value in fish or avoid taxes, they often get slapped on the wrist with a fine. And those fines become the cost of doing um, business. And that's also why we need more severe punishments, right? So if the fine is only $20,000 and you're pulling in tens of millions of dollars of fish in your fish hold, you'll just pay that fine and you'll roll into your operation costs. And we need to make sure that's not the case. And what I've always recommended is you know, having effective deterrence. So when it actually comes to uh, 
um, trying to stop individuals from engaging in illegal activity and illegal fishing, you need to do things like confiscate vessels and actually take away the means of, of illegally fishing. And there are some complications around that from a legal perspective, but it's absolutely necessary. Otherwise, the ships are back out fishing the next day or as soon as you release them from port. We also need more increased monitoring and enforcement. So the oceans are vast. There's a lot of areas that are, are poorly monitored. And there's been some groups that are looking at technology with satellites and AIS and, and various other methods. And those are important. But we also need to remember we need boats in the water that are doing enforcement and monitoring. And I've always, always said, I think it's important that we don't just engage with the authorities on that, but we engage with civil society when it comes to doing um, monitoring and enforcement. Uh, principally monitoring and, and that there's a role for everyone individuals and organizations to help gather information on illegal fishing and um, to, so we can actually have the healthy authorities with their job because it's very challenging and other aspects are improved information sharing and cooperation so again when we have ships traveling across different jurisdictions this adds lots of complicated red tape and you'll see this happening with interdictions where you know it's it's complicated where one government vessel it wants to interdict a vessel from another country and there's complicated aspects there and that's why it's critical that governments share information and cooperate when it comes to combating illegal fishing and not necessarily just focus on their own vessels or on limited areas and and i think just generally it's I mean, the, the way that I think it's important to overall reconceptualize illegal fishing as a form of organized crime is that right now, as an administrative crime, it's not a priority. And so what you see is it's, you know, some funds are given to a couple of inspection vessels. And more recently, we're seeing more, more effort on the part of governments to change this. But five years ago, for example, illegal fishing was, was generally seen as a, an administrative crime. But now as we see governments respecting it as a form of organized crime, we see more money going to the authorities, we see increased punishments, we see more attention being paid, more resources being thrown at enforcement and monitoring. And that's all really important if we actually wanna combat this problem because as we've seen, it's large scale and it's quite insidious. So I think I might just leave it at that. I think um, to wrap up with some final comments on, no, I'll leave it at that. I think they're, they're overall, there, there needs to be a lot more efforts. And just going back to our recommendations here, um, at each stage here, individuals and organizations have a role to play, whether it's lobbying local governments to improve local legislation or increasing punishments, whether it's engaging in monitoring um, from the perspective of an individual organization, um, or whether it's facilitating information and uh, sharing and cooperation between agencies. There's a lot of roles for individuals to play. Um, and going back to not, not just illegal fishing, but overfishing in general, talking to governments about reducing subsidies and reducing overcapacity and increasing monitoring enforcement in general um, of fishing regulations and strengthening fishing regulations are all things that should be considered. So I'll leave it at that and go to questions. I know that was a lot of information as well. I hope everyone uh, came here ready for, uh, for that. And I will uh, stop sharing my screen here and see if I can find the questions. Okay, thank you so much for this um, wonderful presentation. I think you raised a very important issue, um, especially like, I don't know, um, aquatic animals are, um, for some reason um, often forgotten animals and like overfishing activities may just uh, make our oceans empty. Um, so we have some questions for you. The first question is, are there any ways to catch or inspect illegal fishing vessels without going to the open waters and how to get the exact numbers of IUU fishing? Yeah, so I'll answer the first part of that question. Yes, so boats do need to go to port eventually. While transshipment allows some vessels to stay at sea for months at end, sometimes years, some vessels do need to go to port to drop off their catch. And so having monitoring operations at shore can help. And um, so one thing that we've been doing with Oceans Asia is shore-based monitoring with cameras and observers. Um, and my, my colleague Gary and some of our volunteers. And you can do a lot from shore or from near shore. And like I said, because there's crime at every stage in the fishery supply chain, you could be an accountant and spend hours plowing through financial records and identify illegal fishing that way. Or you can look at false labeling and use DNA testing to determine whether two fish are actually being sold as orange rocky aren't actually another fish of lower value. Um, so that basically one of the, the ideas behind identifying crime at every stage in the fishery supply chain means you can tackle crime at every stage. We don't all have a boat to go around at sea to, to interdict illegal fishing operations, but we do all have certain abilities and we can apply those abilities to tackling crime at different stages in the fishery supply chain. If you're looking for exact numbers in IUU, um, Sumela's recent, uh, Sumela et al.'s article from 2020 um, is a pretty good one. It just came out last year. Um, and there's been some previous studies on that. And they explore some of the methodological challenges of calculating this number. 
Um, because again, we are dealing with illicit trade. So it's not like it's, you know, someone's reporting the numbers. They uh, organized criminals don't do uh, good annual reports to their shareholders, as it were. Uh, but Samila's article is a reasonable one. Um, and I always assume those numbers are low um, just because there's a lot of crime going on. Okay, um, thank you. Um, the next question is, what is the most shocking statistics you've faced with regard to illegal fishing uh, numbers or practice? That's a really good question. It's, I mean, I've been doing this for quite a while, so it's really hard to say that anything particularly shocks me at this point. I think some of the stats around the number of uh, the scale of um, labor violations in fishing industries are quite st astounding. So I can't ex remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, so maybe it wasn't the uh, uh, the most prescient, but the you know the number of child slaves that handle shrimp in Bangladesh. There was a study, I think it was by the uh, Environmental Investigation Agency from a few years ago, was quite eye opening. Uh, and I think we often forget that you know places of low governance, you know where governance is low, crime flourishes and crime and abuse flourishes. And that crime and abuse isn't just against animals and marine ecosystems; it's against fishers on vessels as well. And that's also a huge issue. So I think. That one was kind of eye-opening insofar as it added the really strong human rights element to the analysis of illegal fishing. Um, but I mean, learning about sort of the scale of illegal fishing in, in non-traditional or non-popular fisheries is also quite eye-opening to me. So we recently released a report on crime in the sea cucumber industry in India and Sri Lanka. And that kind of shed light on a huge and growing problem that has really been underappreciated because people often focus on sharks and whales and dolphins, but a lot of other species are also being devastated by illegal fishing and wildlife crime, and we don't really appreciate those numbers. So if I can be a little bit self-referential, I would say some of the numbers we found in our recent study on sea cucumbers were quite eye-opening. Yeah, that was actually something new to me that um, I didn't know that sea cucumbers are really popular in the market in um, some Asian countries. Yeah, one of the reasons we got into looking at them was because as you know, there's been a lot of success and effort being made to try and stop illegal shark finning. And our concern was that as we reduce, uh, as we reduce demand for shark fins, demand might shift to other luxury seafood products in air quotes. Um, and those other ones, the major, the four treasures of Cantonese cuisine, shark fins, abalone, fish maw, and sea cucumber. And so we were trying to get ahead of the markets and see if interest shifts towards sea cucumbers, we want to be ready to try and bolster the laws around those. Um, otherwise, you get that situation where the, the industry just jumps from species to species. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is, a whale died this year in the fishing process in Japan and the officer considered is a, a, a bycatch. How to stop this behavior? So yeah, bycatch can be anything from a lot of smaller fish that were caught unnecessarily or um, that aren't target species. It can include sea turtles and sharks and whales and porpoises. And it does depend on the approach you're taking. So for example, I know some groups have worked on turtle exclusion devices and um, devices that will reduce the bycatch on fishing implements. I've worked with some folks in the past on that. Um, there are ways of designing hooks so that, uh, or thawing out your, um, your bait when you're doing long lines so that they don't get a lot of bycatch. Um, and then also just, that's, that's one approach from a technological perspective. And that, that also is linked to regulation, but also, I mean, there are other aspects, which would be things like increasing monitors on vessels. Um, one of the issues that we've had in Hong Kong is uh, we're doing uh, a lot of research on porpoises, and we have a report coming out on, on porpoise conservation shortly. One of the issues that's come up is um, the laws around porpoise conservation are such that if you accidentally catch a porpoise as bycatch, um, you have to prove that you didn't intend to catch it. And that, that is quite a high burden to prove that you didn't intend to do something, to prove your intent. Um, and as a result, um, we're concerned that people are just dumping the porpoises they might accidentally catch. Uh, now, if those porpoises are deceased, we can, can't capture the data um, to get a better understanding of populations and sources of mortality. Um, and if they're alive or injured, we don't know that they, they can't get the support, and the, the support they need to rehabilitate them. So sometimes well-intentioned laws need to be slightly tweaked to increase compliance, but having observers on board can also help. You know, there's a lot of, or video observers, by the way, because sometimes the role of observer is incredibly dangerous. But there's a lot of ocean out there. And as soon as there's no one watching, a lot of sketchy and illegal and dangerous activity takes place. And so when it comes to activism around this, you may want to explore shoring up regulations around reporting and observers and oversight in the fishing industries um, or looking at technology. Those are, are two solutions that come to mind. Mm -hmm. um, what international law source do you think is mostly enforced? Are there any regional treaties in Asia on IUU fishing? 
that's a good question. I mean, I don't know if I would pick one law source that's mostly enforced. I think that's a challenging question because, yeah, I don't know if I, I'd be able to answer that question directly, but I would say that a lot of fisheries deal with uh, regional fisheries management organizations or RFMOs. So there'll be a region. Um, so when you're talking about Africa or itself or Asia itself, um, each different region will have a different regional fisheries management organization and each one may have its strengths or weaknesses um, it's blaring errors, <laughs> it's, uh, it's problematic structures. Um, so it really does depend on the fishery. And I, I, nothing, no particular fisher comes to mind as far as being like particularly well-regulated. Um, mostly because I focus on the ones that aren't well-regulated. So I don't know if I could pick one that uh, is very well-regulated. I know perhaps on the West Coast out here in Canada, the salmon fishery is seems to be well-regulated from what I can tell, but I wouldn't speculate otherwise. Um, the, the issue of course, yeah, my focus would be what I would probably say is some of the places that are more remote probably have a lot of illegal fishing. So for example, at one point in the Southern Ocean, the Patagonian toothfish industry, the estimates were that 90% of the fish on the market were from an illegal source. That's been improving in recent years, but that's a serious problem. And that stems from the fact that you have high seas, incredibly remote areas, complicated overlapping legal jurisdictions around the Antarctic Treaty. And um, yeah, and that, that makes it very difficult to enforce those laws. Yeah, um, we have our last question. Um, do you think it's possible to connect illegal fishing activities to international criminal law, given that under international criminal law, there is just an individual liability? Yes, I think, I think yes. Um, and I think there's two aspects here that could be explored. One of them is looking at finding the beneficial owners. And this is why I kind of highlighted that as a problem where we don't know, actually know who is the beneficial owner of the vessel. But if we can identify them, they can be brought to justice. Um, the Operation Sparrow in, in Spain with Vidal Armadores is a good example of that. Or the Bengus case is another good case out of South Africa and the United States, where you see um, court cases pursuing the beneficial owners um, through criminal law. Um, the, for those who are interested, the Bengus case is, is a really good one to look at. Um, but yeah, basically, I think there is a lot of problems here. And this is kind of why I'm so focused on, on highlighting illegal fishing as organized crime, uh, because... Um, then you can start focusing on it and putting the resources in and treating as a criminal matter as opposed to administrative law. So a lot of countries are moving in that direction, which has been very promising. Not enough, not quickly enough, of course, but I think it's a necessary step to actually tackle the problem. So yeah, really good question. And so for those of you who are in various jurisdictions, exploring how you can move laws into from administrative to criminal will increase penalties, it will increase police enforcement activities, government resources going to combating that crime and ultimately help stop the problem. Okay, um, thank you so much for your- And thank you all for your questions. I appreciate them. Thank you. <laughs>